Alrighty, how long do we have? How long do we have? Hmm? One hour and a half. What? <laughs> <laughs> Two hours? <laughs> Two hours, okay. Uh, <clears throat> right, we're gonna go faster than usual. All right, everybody, thank you very much for joining us today. I'm excited to be here. Uh, before we get started, before we get underway, we have something of the utmost uh, importance that I need to address. When I say spring, you say open source. One, <laughs> two, spring. Open source. <laughs> Ah, that's so good, that's so money, thank you. Very good, right on. Now, we don't have a lot of time today. In fact, we have almost no time, so I'm gonna go very, very, very fast today. The goal here, my friends, isn't, uh, isn't so much that you remember everything that we're about to do, it's more that you appreciate what's possible and you'll be able to find, no doubt, resources on the inner tubes uh, for your own reference later on. Now, um, how many of you have used Spring? Oh, well that solves a lot. What about Spring Boot? Okay, okay, good, good. Um, yeah, do you, any of you work here at PayPal? Okay, there's a, apparently there's a framework in here called Raptor. Have you heard of it? And uh, some of it's now being on Spring Boot or something like that? Yeah, uh, that was a, they, we had people from PayPal that spoke at Spring One last week, or two weeks ago, about their use of Spring Boot, so I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, anyway, Anyway, we're going to do an ever so quick review of Spring Boot, just to make sure we're on the same page. Uh, and then we're going to talk about Spring Cloud, okay? So uh, hold on tight. Now, wh while that slide's up there, I would encourage you to grab the bits, grab my coordinates up there for your own reference and edification uh, for later on. So that's my Twitter. How many of you are on Twitter? It's 2016, Twitter. <laughs> Twitter. Okay, get on Twitter. It's the new place to be. It's the new IRC. I love Twitter, and you should too. Uh, what about email? How many of you have email? <laughs> email. Email. Anybody? Okay, well grab those as well. I'm happy to answer questions, talk to you, feedback, whatever. Should we turn off the lights? Can you all see that screen? If I were to start going really fast with a lot of code, would your eyes be able to follow that code for the next two hours without blinking? Yes. No blinking, right? It's okay. Um, everybody got that? You got it? He's got it. He's trying to get it. Okay. Um, a little bit about me, as was just well explained. My name is Josh Long. I'm the Spring Developer Advocate on the Spring team at Pivotal. Uh, I'm a, an open source contributor and engineer. I'm the number one, top ranked, seven years running, contributor of bugs uh, to projects. <laughs> <laughs> to projects like Spring Boot and Spring Cloud and Spring Innovation and Spring Batch and Bodden and Timely and Activity, okay? Number one. Very proud of that. I gotta have something. Uh, I'm also a... Uh, uh, a Java champion. This is a rare honor that's bestowed upon folks in the community who do their level-headed best, like I've uh, thus far tried to do, to engage and help the community uh, you know, better themselves with Java. And a big part of that, of course, is my time before audiences like yourselves uh, talking about software, I'm talking about how to build next-level software as best as we can. Uh, and a part of that, of course, is <laughs> writing uh, books and blogs and magazine articles and, and uh, doing videos. So the latest and greatest training video, of course, is uh, building microservice with Spring Boot Live Lessons with my, uh, my friend, the one, the only, the amazing, the inimitable, Phil Webb, who's the co-founder of Spring Boot. Uh, and then, of course, there's my latest and greatest as yet unpublished book. Uh, it's called Cloud Native Java. For those of you who are wondering, uh, and I know you are, I can see it in your eyes, that bird is the, is the blue-eared kingfisher from the Indonesian Java Island. So it's, so it's a bird that you see that lives in the clouds. Birds fly in clouds, they're, they're birds, you see. <laughs> from Java, it's a, it's a native bird <laughs> from, the Java, from the Java islands in the, never mind, it's fine. It'll, it'll, it'll come, it'll come, okay, it's fine. Don't worry about it. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and I'm also, um, you know, fond of this t-shirt. So there's, there's that. And I work at Pivotal, so how many of you know Pivotal? Ah, oh, it's not nearly enough. So Pivotal's a, we're a small company with big dreams. We have big hopes and aspirations. Uh, we're the uh, home, the originators of lots of great open source stuff. So how many of you know uh, Tomcat, Apache Tomcat, Tomcat? 
anybody. So Tomcat, of course, is not just the animal from Indonesia. It's also an application server. And uh, you're welcome. You're welcome. Um, what about Cloud Foundry? How many of you know Cloud Foundry? Cloud Foundry. So Cloud Foundry is an open source platform. It's optimized for the continuous and safe delivery of software into production. We care about the evolution of software uh, and the deployment and management of that software. Uh, and we care about open source, but let's be very, very clear here. Let's just really, really be clear. Open source is not our raison d'etre at Pivotal. It's not the reason we're here. It's not the reason we wake up inspired to go to work every morning. You see, we care instead about helping customers, community members, and organizations move quickly and safely from concept to production. And we've seen that a lot of organizations struggle with this movement. They struggle with the, the progression of software from, uh, from concept through the value chain off hopefully onto production. And they struggle with how to go quickly through that circuit from product management, user experience, developers, testers, administrators, and then off into production. A lot of these organizations are lucky enough to have been around for more than 10 years. They've got software that predates the era of cloud computing and the economics that uh, sort of inspired it. They have software that is made of lots and lots of code, lots of code in a large, large code, code base that requires a large team to evolve. This monolithic code base is uh, you know, a bit of a problem today. Sure, it was well designed for the time in which it was conceived, but today it presents a bit of an obstacle because time is of the essence. And large code bases require large amounts of people to be able to change, to evolve. If you have a lot of people involved, it takes a long time to, to do darn near anything. So the trick is, how can we take this large code base and this large team and then decompose it into smaller bits? How can we make it smaller? How can we break it apart and let that in such a way that each bit can be more nimbly and more agilely evolved? We can turn to this idea of microservices, right? Microservices are a, a fairly obvious idea. The idea here is to break apart our large application into smaller bits so that a small group of people can work on smaller batches of work so that they can focus on a small batch of work and push it more quickly through the value chain. This is a, a hack on Mel Conway's law. How many of you have heard of Ke Conway's law? It's not, it's not entirely new. I'm sure we've talked about it before. The idea, Mel Conway talked about the idea that uh, <coughs> software is a reflection of the organizational structure that it serves. So if you have two different teams that don't do a good job of communicating with each other and they're responsible for different modules in the system, they're gonna do a crap job of integrating that software together. I've heard it alternatively stated that if you have four different teams working on a compiler, intellectually you'll have a four-pass compiler. And they've done tests that confirm this. They've done studies. They did comparisons of open source and proprietary software. And they realized uh, that the dynamics of the teams involved creating the software, in, you know, <coughs> it, they, they <coughs> change the way that the software is created itself. So modular, uh, sorry, open source software rather, tends to be more modular, better, better, better defined. And this is because the people involved in that open source software tend to be contributing at different paces, different times, different opportunities, different days of the week, different time zones. So the communication boundary between the different teams has to be the API. It's not easy for them to all just jump on a bridge and talk about stuff on a phone call. Some people will be working on the weekend, some at night, some, at, some every once, in a, once a month. Versus proprietary software where everybody's sat in the same room and they can just turn their chair and say, hey, what do you think of this? tends to be less, less formally defined. The APIs, the boundaries between components and proprietary software tend to be less, less well defined. So the question is, of course, is how do we define these modules? How do we define small? How do we identify a, a part of the domain? We can turn to Dr. Eric Evans. Dr. Eric Evans has a great book called Domain Driven Design. Anybody, anybody know that book? Preach it, right on. So Domain Driven Design uh, uh, espouses the idea of a clear domain model. In the book, he talks about this idea of a bounded context, a, a part of the domain that, when extracted from the larger whole, stands unto itself, internally consistent and reusable. A bounded context is a crispening of the domain of an application. Right? And that's pretty vague, and I definitely recommend you uh, look at the book for more, but suppose you have this context of sales versus customer service. Nominally, you have an idea of customer in both cases, both domains, both contexts. But the customer that is trying to get a refund is very different from the, per from the one that you're trying to incentivize to pay purchase something. They have different life cycles. You, you have different states, different data. These are not the same customer. And to treat them both as the same thing, the same entity, muddies the definition and makes them less valuable for each context. Tease them apart, treat them separate, keep them separate. 
and you'll have an easier time of it, and you now have an ideal candidate for this small batch of work that we're looking for. Small batch of work on which a small group of people can iterate and deploy independently. Another question, of course, is how, how small is a small group of people? In the West, that answer, uh, you know, I think is best delivered by uh, so a guy like uh, Amazon's Jeff Bezos. Jeff Bezos talks about uh, two pizza box teams. A two pizza box team, naturally, has a very different meaning than it does here, right? In the, in the West, where I come from, uh, two boxes of pizza feeds five, six, seven people. Here, it's like a school bus, right? <laughs> so, so I get I get the confusion. I get why you're not understanding what I'm saying here. But uh, it's very different, right? Small is the point. The, the the cost of communication between the team members has to be very minimal. That's the the, the ability to go fast. That's what gives you that agility. If you can unite these people, focus all these people on delivering a feature or, or a bounded context, you co-locate all the people in the value chain involved in, in moving that feature through production, through development, product management, user experience, develop, testers, administrators, etc. Get them all co-located in one small feature team or two pizza box team. Then you have what Netflix calls a feature team. So now you've got a small team working on a small bit batch of functionality that can be moved and deployed independent of the rest of the software. This is very, very useful. Once you've, got, once you've done this, now you can have different teams that can control their own destiny. You can go faster and you don't have to, you don't have, to have constant meetings about what you're gonna do, you can just do, right? This is very, very, very powerful, but there are two things that you're gonna run head, headlong into when you move to this approach. Two things that you need to be able to address upfront and quickly. The first thing is how quickly can you uh, stand up a new production-worthy service and all that that implies, and I mean, how can you quickly can you address things like observability and security? How quickly can you stand up the infrastructure and the middleware required to support that service? How quickly can you do things like health checks and load balancing? For one service, you have to do all of that, right? Most organizations that I've been to have a nightmarish, terrifying wiki page, the, the wiki page with 500 easy steps to production. That wiki page is the enemy of velocity. It, it's what frustrates our ability to stand up services quickly, and if that list is overwhelming if that list of things that we need to address quickly uh, is too um, discouraging, then we won't do it. We are all products in the s of the systems in which we exist. I don't believe that there are good people and bad people. There are good systems and bad systems. And if the system in which you find yourself <coughs> makes doing the wrong thing, the easy thing, then you will very understandably and reasonably do the wrong thing. It's human nature. Think about databases, right? Databases are a common example. You see, and so is, so, is a, so is a provisioning of application servers, right, infrastructure. If it takes forever to get a new application server, a new you know, environment set up for a new service, then it's so easy just to say, oh, okay, I'll just add another rest endpoint to this giant big ball of mud API that we've already got. Nobody's gonna notice. It's much better than doing the right thing and factoring it out into a separate domain. And even if I did, I'd still have to get another database, and that'll take forever. And God help you if you're trying to get another kind of database, right, doing the right thing, Means being, you know, means exercising discretion about the, the technology you use for <coughs> your data. If you're trying to do a full, uh, trying to do a search engine, then by all means use a full text search engine like Elasticsearch or or Solar. This is far better than trying to shoehorn it into a into a Oracle's, you know, full text indexes. If you're trying to do, uh, if you're trying to store binary data, keep bits. The right thing to do is to use a bit bucket or maybe Amazon S3 or MongoDB's GridFS, not shoehorning that into a blob in Oracle. If you're trying to, to handle geospatial queries, geographic queries, the right thing to do is to use something like Couchbase's GIS queries, you know, geo-indexes, right? Not to, not to punt down another 90,000 for Oracle Spatial, right? Uh, if you're trying to randomly lose data at, at random times for no apparent reason, the right thing to do is to use MongoDB, but for, fun, you know, for Pete's sake, for Pete's sake, use the right tool for the job. And if it takes too much effort, it takes too many tickets and too many, uh, too many discussions to get that to be done, then you won't. You'll just shoehorn it into the existing bits, which is a shame, because doing the right thing is, it, it feels better eventually. It's better for morale. So how quickly can you get past all that? How quickly can you stand up a new production-worthy mm -hmm. service? That's the first question you need to answer. And we'll talk ever so briefly about some of that today with Spring Boot and Cloud Foundry. 
Then the second question that you're going to run into uh, is once you've done that, once you've stood up all these small interconnected uh, but independently deployed small batches of work communicating over the network, once you've done that, you've now got, you've got a distributed system. And if there's anything, if there's anything at all that upon which we can all agree, no matter where we come from, east, west, etc., it's that building a distributed system is hard. And so for that, today we're going to look at something called Spring Cloud, which makes it easy to, to build distributed systems. Now, as most of you have already seen Spring Boot or worked with Spring Boot, I won't spend too long in that particular technology uh, because I really want to talk about Spring Cloud because if I, if I can do one thing for you today, I think it's going to be Spring Cloud. Now, <clears throat> any questions on that before we get going? Right on. If you have questions at all, I really want you to feel free. I want you to feel free because I know that it's late and people feel uh, they don't they don't feel the um, the enthusiasm. So I want you to feel free if you have any questions at all to hold them until the very end and then ask. Okay? <laughs> because we're probably going to get you an answer anyway. Yeah. Now, those are my slides. I worked hard on those. I hope you appreciate that. <laughs> Moving on. See. Trap. Yes. Why, sure. I didn't know that worked. Command shift backspace on the trash on the on the OS 10. That empties your trash. I, I was trying to clear my history. I didn't know it emptied the trash. Cool. All right. Um. So we're gonna go to my second favorite place on the internet. My second favorite place on the internet is start.spring.io. My first favorite place, of course, is production. I love production, and you should too. And if you haven't gone to production, you should. It's great. The weather's nice, the people are friendly. It's the happiest place on earth. It's better than Disneyland. I love production, and you should too. But if you haven't gotten there, then start your journey here at start.spring.io. If, if you want for inspiration in the early morning before your cup of tea or coffee, start.spring. .io. If your children are restless and can't sleep, start. <laughs> .spring. .io. And if you suffer from indigestion, perhaps after a long, long night with very, very spicy laksa, start. .spring. .io. Bookmark it, keep it close to your heart, keep it with you at all times. And what we're gonna do, my friends, is we're gonna build a very simple, simple service. I'm gonna call it the reservation service, and I'm not gonna spend too much time uh, explaining all the options here, but I'm gonna take advantage of different technologies that Spring supports. So I'll bring in the web support, I'll bring in the config client, I'll bring in Eureka for service registration discovery, RabbitMQ for stream processing, Zipkin for distributed tracing, uh, REST repository support, and JPA, uh, which is a, the, the Java persistence API, because I make poor life decisions. So. JPA. I'm going to use I'm going to use the H2 in-memory embedded SQL database. H2 is an in-memory embedded SQL database that loses all of its state on every restart, and so in this way, uh, it's very similar to MongoDB. Now, <laughs> what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch to the full version to show you some of the extra options here. When I switch to the full version, you can see there's a veritable ocean of checkboxes, different options that you can use to to better your workload, better your your application. Let's see what we can do here, my friends. I've got this really goofy table. There we are. Now we're cooking. Who does that? Do 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 do. do. There we are. That looks a, that's a wee bit better, isn't it? So, I've got now. So now, I've got a, a variable ocean of different checkboxes, options that I can use in my application to support my use case. Uh, and I could check those, but I, I'm fine now. A lot of people get very confused here. <coughs> you see, here we have three very interesting drop downs. I encourage you to take a look and, and peruse these options here. You should absolutely exercise some discretion as to which language on the JVM you'd like to use. Any language on the JVM that supports annotations and objects will work just fine. So Java, Scala, Groovy, Kotlin, they're all great choices. Uh, have at them, please. 
But here, my friends, here we have two non-choices. <laughs> these, are, these are choices that you could make, but that you shouldn't. They're choices. They're choices in the same way that stripping naked and running in traffic is a choice. You could, but, but, but don't. Don't. So, for example, which version of the JVM would you like to use? <coughs> As both 1.6 and 1.7 are more than a year past end of life, gone, expired, dead, no longer supported, not available, past their prime, not fresh. As both of them are end of life, to continue using either one would be irresponsible and an active source of technical debt for your organization. To start a new project on either one is insane, certifiable. So never ever choose either one of these choices, and WebSphere is no excuse. <laughs> and then here, we have the choice of packaging. And again, a lot of people get very confused about this. They don't know when and where to choose which, so I'm gonna do my level-headed best here and now to explain. If, by some crazy, crazy freak fluke of physics, some terrible accident of physics, you find yourself stuck in the very, 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 very distant past, far, far, far beyond modern help, then choose dot y. <laughs> but if you're here with me, in 2016, Lion City. Then choose dot jar. This is a big part of my overarching, guiding, personal philosophy of make jar, not war. And again, you have options, you have choices. You should do what works for you, which in this case coincides with what I've told you to do. So that works out well for both of us, okay? <laughs> now, I'm gonna go ahead and hit generate, and that'll give me a new zip file. And I'm not gonna spend too long building this simple application. I just wanna have a domain. I wanna have an application with which we can work as we, uh, as we build our example up. So let me close this. And again, it doesn't matter what IDE you use. Uh, how many of you, how many of you use uh, IntelliJ? Show of hands. Good stuff, hot sauce, well done. <laughs> what, about, what about Eclipse, my friends? How many of you use Eclipse? <laughs> right on, good stuff as well. And uh, what about NetBeans? What about NetBeans? How many of you are using NetBeans? Cool, right on. <laughs> no. Hey, they all work great. You don't even need the application server support in any of those tools. You can just need you just need basic Java 8 support and Maven. That's all, right? What about Emacs? Are you here, sir? <laughs> are you here? Are you here, buddy? Where is he? Oh, there you are. It's this guy. Every country I go to, and I visit probably in excess of 30 countries, 40 countries a year, hundreds of cities. Every city I go to, it's him. Same, same human. <laughs> I don't know how you can get the budget to follow me to every place, but it's so, so not okay. We have to talk to my lawyer about that. Now, uh, sometimes I ask who uses Emacs, and it's just, I do, and then he leaves. <laughs> That's all he's come for, is just to troll about Emacs. So we're gonna build a very simple domain model, and I don't care all that much about the domain, I just wanna have something with which we can play. So it's gonna be an object type reservation, it's gonna be a JPA entity, you know, I'll signal as much by using at ID and at generic value, and uh, then I'll uh, use at entity here, like so, and uh, I'll create some getters, there we are, I'll create a constructor, there we go, another constructor as well, so good. All right, this is for JPA alone. Okay, we'll create a two string method, there's that. Now, what I wanna do is I wanna store some records in the database, so I'm gonna use Spring Data declarative repositories, and uh, the idea here is that I wanna make short work of the tedious, soul annihilatingly boring work of reading, writing, and updating <laughs> records of type reservation. Because remember, uh, this is not business differentiating, differentiating functionality, right? It's not gonna further my lot in life, make me a better uh, person, it's not gonna advance my business. It's undifferentiated heavy lifting, as uh, Adrian Cockcroft would say. And I want this API to be a simple REST API, so I'll say REST repository resource, uh, repository REST resource, rather, and uh, Spring Data REST will turn it into a REST API for me, and then finally I'm gonna create some sample data, like this. And uh, the sample data, you know, I'm just gonna, it's a callback interface. This is a command line runner in Spring Boot, and it gets invoked after the application has started up, but before uh, most of the components have been put into service. So it's a, an enviable place to do any kind of batch or ETL or integration or messaging that you wanna do for application initialization. Now, my name is Josh, it's nice to meet you. I'm joined today by my buddy and pal, uh, Sergio and Michael or Michiel, Michel. Um, 
And uh, who else? What's your name, buddy? Raven. Sorry? Raven. How do you spell it, friend? H-U-I-R-E-N. H-U-I-R-E-N? Nice to meet you. Very cool. Uh, what about you, boss? Adrian. A-D-R-I-N? Cool. Nice to meet you as well. Uh, what about you, buddy? C-J. How, just C and J? Yeah. <coughs> Thank you. Nice to meet you. Uh, what about you, buddy? Yeah. I mean, yeah. A-M-E-Y-A. Wait, A? I'm sorry, I, I, I farted. My brain farted. <laughs> what? A M E Y A. There, very cool. Nice to meet you. Uh, and uh, what about you, buddy? John? Yep, how do you spell it? S I S H A. S H A. S H A. Oh, cool. N K. N K? Like that? Yeah. Very good. Nice to meet you. That's uh, eight. I think we can do four more. Uh, is there. Is there a female at all? <laughs> oh, hi, good, thank you for coming. What's your name? Sonia. S-O-N-Y-A? Yeah. Lovely to meet you as well. Thanks for coming. Uh, any other females? Hi. Hi, I'm Fern. F-R-F-L? Okay, very good, thank you for coming and nice to meet you. Uh, and uh, we need two more, what about you in the back? Put it up with the red shirt. Me? Yep. Tahoe. Sorry? Tahoe. Cool. P E N T. P E N T? Z. Z? G. G. Like that? Yep. Very good. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um, and uh, I don't know. It's just. <laughs> what about you in the very back with the blue shirt? Hi. Yep. Yep. XO. Really? Oh, A X E L. German? If I exit, then yeah, but the name is actually Swedish. Very, very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> well, all right. I know there's a the guy who creates a uh, the guy who created uh, Flyway. Is it also Axel Fontaine or something like that? It's interesting. Well, usually it's just Axel Foley or Axel Rose or something. Yeah. Oh, those. I don't know those at all. Axel Rose actually does this. Yeah. Who's that? Is he as cool as the guy from Liquibase? No, the music, the music guy. Yeah. Ah, whatever. You kids and your rap music, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. <laughs> anyway, for each name, I'm going to write a record to the database. I'll say new reservation, pass in the name, and then I'll say reservation repository at find all, and I'm going to print out every record that comes back. Now, here I'm using a very nice feature in Java 8. How many of you have used Java 8 so far? Oh, it's terrible. The rest of you, get on it. Come on, what are you doing? <laughs> wow. So Java 8 is awesome. It's great. It's, it even rhymes with great. That's how great it is. Uh, it has a lot of nice features that help keep Java at the very vanguard of modern technologies, modern languages. Here, for example, I'm using a feature that uh, is unique to very modern, very new, very cons you know, uh, progressive languages uh, like uh, C <laughs> <laughs> and COBOL. <laughs> and uh, Lisp, Smalltalk, Perl, <laughs> Ruby, Python, Lua, Erlang, Haskell, Go, Fork, PHP, Basic, Visual Basic, Visual Basic.net, ActionScript, ECMAScript, TypeScript, C Sharp, C++, Objective-C, Visual Basic.net, F Sharp, JScript.net. <coughs> languages like PH, no. <laughs> languages like, oh. Languages like no, I can't. PHP. <laughs> Even PHP has this feature. So, so it's very nice that in Java 8, there's a new feature that only these other modern languages from the last 60 or so years have. A feature that we introduced in Java uh, two years ago. So what this lets us do is write a Lambda expression. I think that's very cool. OK, if we start that up, we should see results very, very quickly. It's a Gonna, it's going to write the records in the database, uh, and then we can confirm that they're all there by calling the find all method, and we'll see them printed on the console here, okay? Now, localhost 8080 forward slash reservations of uh, something, a foul. <coughs> Did I? Spell my entity incorrectly? No? 
Oh, re ah, resource. Well, that sucks. Okay. So we should see very quickly here that everything's come to you know it's come to life. We've gotten the results we expected. We should see on the console. We should see reflected here on the console uh, the names of the records that we just inserted into the database, and we should be able to confirm uh, that each of one of them has been given an auto incrementing primary key uh, here, right? So there's there we are. There we are. We happy few. Uh, Josh and Sergio and Michael and Liran and Adrian and CJ and and so on, right? All of us are here on the console, uh, and it worked. Of course it worked, it was a demo. What were you expecting? It was always going to work. <laughs> there, was, there was no doubt about that. Uh, instead, what I really, really wanted to talk to you about was this. This is the ASCII artwork. Now, I don't know how much you know about ASCII artwork, but I'm a big fan. Now, this ASCII artwork took a long time to get right. You see, we on the Spring team have people who are doctors, PhDs. People who in their previous lives worked in nuclear physics, star stuff, the very celestial bodies, and the heavens above us were their daily bread and butter. And so it makes me very happy to imagine that someday, somewhere, somehow, there was a GitHub issue that said, damn it, we need good ASCII artwork. And look at that. I think they did a great job. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely amazing. Now, it's at this point that I'd like to take a brief, ever so brief digression to talk about what I consider to be a very, very serious deficiency in the JetBrains IntelliJ product. For while I'm a fan, I think this is particularly poorly conceived. What the hell? <laughs> Why is that there? That's a dumb feature. And so I did what all people do when confronted with adversity, challenge, and, and uh, despair. I went on the internet and I cried. And I was greeted by a message of hope from my buddy, Jan Sabron, who's a software developer by passion at IntelliJ Jet, JetBrains. And he responded with this message of hope, which I share with you now, today. <laughs> Don't worry, my friends. We're going to make IntelliJ great again. Now, sometimes people ask me to my sadness, despair, and borderline rage, how do I change the ASCII artwork? As if wanting to get rid of it was bad enough, <coughs> wasn't bad enough. How do I change the ASCII artwork? And that's a dumb question. Even now, I resist the urge to start flipping tables and storming out the room. But I can see that there are some people whose talents are uh, mirrored enough that they may want to do this. So I'll show you how. You can just put in place your own ASCII artwork. Downloads, reservation service, source, main, resources, banner.txt. And uh, when I restart now, having done all that hard work, we should be able to confirm that it's much better. Now, <laughs> there's a few things I want to share with you about this. This is, a, this is not mine. This is a colleagues of mine, Stefan, Nicole, and... Brian Clozel. There's a few things I wanted to share about this. First of all, meow. <laughs> and then second of all, and this is my favorite part, and it's basically why we're here, and if you get one thing out of this talk, let it be this. Anyway, now we've got an application. It's got hypermedia. It's got a REST API. We can confirm as much by visiting it here, 8080 forward slash reservations. And voila, right? Just a simple REST API, and we can, uh, we can visit each record, reservations one, two, three, et cetera. We can do a search, you know, go like this, reservation search. Hello, computer. Where's my search endpoint? Oh, I didn't have any finder methods, so there's no search endpoint. But the point is I have an API. Uh, this is Spring Boot, and Spring Boot provides a framework called the actuator. And the actuator is designed to uh, expose information about the individual state of the uh, individual host and the node on which the application is running. So this is um, meant to surface information for centralized monitoring infrastructure. You see, we need to care about observability in a cloud native system. The actuator is a part of that. There are four tenants, by the way. We should keep this in our heads as we move forward in time for the balance of our talk. There are four tenants to a cloud native system. There's The system should be it should lend itself to agile and easy uh, evolution and be easy to evolve. It should be uh, dynamic and do the right thing in the, case of, uh, in the face of elasticity in a cloud environment. It should <coughs> do the right thing in the face of failure 
uh, in a cloud environment, and it should be observable. That is to say, I should be able to monitor it from its outputs. A part of that is served by the actuator. The actua actuator provides, for example, endpoints like metrics, which gives me an enumeration of uh, you know, environment variables and qualities about the ap application itself. I can say uh, that I can go to the help endpoint, for example, and I can see here that, are, that there are different components of my application, each of which has its own status, right? So this is a very simple Spring Boot application. And uh, if you know about Spring Boot, then you know that I can change different parts of the application by going to source main resources application properties and plugging in any number of different properties <laughs> to override the default behavior. These properties inform the behavior, but they, uh, uh, you know, they have useful defaults often, so you don't have to worry about it. I can change them in the code, in the property file, in the jar, or I can override them in the shell here. So CD, downloads, reservation, service, maven, minus D, skip test, because YOLO, clean install. Okay, I'll take some water. Sweet nectar. Now, if I go to the target directory here, you'll see I have a so-called fat jar. This jar has everything I need to run this code. Everything I need to run this code in a self-contained manner. I don't need to deploy it into any other thing except for an operating system and with a JDK. This, this jar is really easy to operationalize. I can, I can attach it as an attachment and send it to my dear sentient grandmother. <laughs> and my grandmother, who is very intelligent and very, very interesting and very smart, and she's not particularly conversant with computers. But she can run this because she has applets. So if your WebSphere adult operations teams have trouble running this, have them call my dear sainted grandmother. <laughs> She'll help them get to production faster. Now, that said, we still have questions of configuration. How do I promote this from one environment to another? I showed you that we can change the properties here, properties like server.port equals AD10, but how do I change those properties as I move the application from one environment to another? And here, tow factor style configuration is very useful. The idea behind a 12 factor behind 12 factor style configuration originates from the 12 factor manifesto, which is just a set of 12 common sense uh, guidelines, uh, good clean cloud hygiene, if you will, for building applications that live and breathe in the cloud. 12 factor style configuration stipulates that environment specific configuration should live, guess where, in the environment, not in the code. I shouldn't have to recompile. And Spring Boot supports this very well, right? I can say server.port equals 8010, minus jar, reservation service that jar, and we'll see the application now spin up on port 8010 instead of the default, which was 8080. Now, here's this, okay? Uh, I can also use environment variables. I can say export server underscore port equals 8040, java minus jar, reservation service that jar, and uh, we'll see that here as well. So I'm using environment variables to inform the default behavior without having to recompile the code. And this is pretty good. This isn't bad for, for, uh, for horseshoes, right? But we need to do a little bit better. For you see, this is going to fall short of four key scenarios. Suppose I wanted to centralize my configuration. At the moment, I'm going to have to tediously copy and paste my configuration across startup scripts and all, all, that, all those sorts of things. What if I wanted to keep sensitive information, locators, credentials, that kind of stuff? Uh, how do I store that? Certainly not at rest, unencrypted on the file system, right? <coughs> What if I want to change the configuration while the service is running? At the moment, I'd have to restart the service each time to observe those changes. And how do I support auditing and journaling? How do I see who changed what and then, if necessary, to roll that configuration back? For all these use cases and more, while what I've got here thus far is a good start, it's not nearly enough. One approach to solve some of these problems might be to use a, a, a central <coughs> directory, a directory full of configuration. That would certainly address the centralization problem. I could also make that directory based on Git. That would solve the, uh, the uh, auditing and journaling requirement. But what about the security requirement? To do effective security, we need something in the middle, something that can act as a little bit of a indirection between the client, the client of the configuration, and the source of the configuration. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to stand up a config server. And I'm going to call it, guess what, the config service. Here we go. And the config server is just that. It's a server that's going to babysit uh, or manage a directory full of configuration property files for us. So I need to use the right annotation, at enable config server or abracadabra config server. And then we need to give this some information so that it can find the right configuration directory 
and then broker that out and mediate that out for other clients that are gonna that are gonna use it. I'm gonna get a directory full of configuration based on Git that solves my auditing and journaling requirement and store it on my desktop. And I'm gonna run this application on port 8888. Now, my configuration is here. GitHub.com, Josh Long, Buddha for microservices. Config or not. Uh, yes, I did. Oh, GitHub. Clone, desktop, config, there we are. And uh, that should be everything I need to get this up and running. Now, suppose I'm a client microservice identified as the reservation hyphen service. What configuration would I see were I to connect to the uh, config service? I can answer that question by visiting the config service here, reservation hyphen service forward slash default, okay? Or not, should I? Did I fail here? <coughs> oh, son of a gun, guys. There we are. So now, here I can see that there are two property sources of which the config service is aware. The first is the properties from the file called reservation-service, the second from the property file called application.properties. All microservices, no matter what their name, will see the configuration from the uh, property file called reservation-service.properties, but only the microservice, uh, um, sorry, they will see the properties from the uh, property file called application.properties, but only the microservice uh, called reservation service will see the configuration from the property file called reservation hyphen service that properties. These two sets of properties are flattened, they're merged together at runtime uh, to form one set of properties that the configuration client will, will see. So if we connect our microservice, our reservation service, to this config server, we'll see it spin up on port 8000, we'll see that it has access to this message called, uh, interestingly enough, hello world. <coughs> um, so let's do that. We need, of course, to have the Spring Cloud Starter Config Client Library on the class path to be able to use this. And uh, we need to then tell the config client where the configuration is and how to use it. So spring that application that name equals reservation hyphen client spring dot cloud dot config dot URI equals localhost eighty eight eighty eight. And this information is used earlier on in the initialization of the application. This is used before the application has started applying the properties. So necessarily, it needs to be used in the bootstrap phase, which is why, by convention, this property file is called bootstrap.properties. Now, if everything goes to plan, this application should spin up on port 8000, but let's take advantage of that message that we just created here. So we'll say, private final string value, create a constructor, and we'll inject the value there, and then we're gonna create an endpoint, public uh, string read, turn this dot value, and uh, I'm gonna map this endpoint to an HTTP get that responds to forward slash message. And I may later, at my own discretion, want to change this value whilst the service is running. So I'm going to make this bean refresh scoped. And then I'm going to restart. And if everything goes as we expect, we should see that, as I say, we should see it spin up on port 8000. And we should see it have access to uh, the, the new message endpoint, which is injecting the message value, or rather it's not, and so it's going to fail. Forgot about this. I knew I forgot something. So what that's doing is it's injecting the key called message from the config server. Yeah. Localhost 8000 forward slash reservations. Hello computer. What the? Does 
anybody here see something I'm not seeing? Do you need auto wire when you do like bikes? Sorry? Do you need auto wire when you do like bad bikes? Yes. Unless you're doing it on a field. What did I do wrong? P kill Java. Start that up. Application bootstrap reservation service. That was unfortunate. That could have been avoided if I had just been a little bit more awake. Bummer. Okay. Well, we'll sit here anxiously waiting for the results. Waiting on you. What? Somehow. It's got an extra space. Son of a motherless goat. Look at that. That stupid message. The config server what? I, I restarted it. I felt bad for it. Um, so we're, we're friends again. Okay. <laughs> oh, that was really hard, guys. Let's not do that again. So port 8000 message. Voila, the message is working, but we can do better. You see, this message, while true, isn't really great, and we are at nothing if not great today, right? So let's go to the config directory here. I'm going to open up the reservation service step properties, and I'm going to open this up in my IDE, and I'll uh, effect a change. Hello. The change will be hello, singa sug. No, sug. There we go. Extra exclamation mark so as to reinforce uh, my credentials, authority, and authenticity on Reddit. Okay, so there's <laughs> this. And I'll save it. And then I'll visit this and I'll say git commit minus a minus m YOLO. Now, when I visit the config service, localhost 8080, sorry, 8888 forward slash reservation hyphen service, we should see that the value is immediately visible uh, in the config service. So that's worked, but our downstream service doesn't seem to have any idea of what's just happened. And this is by design. We don't want each configuration client constantly pulling the downstream config server for fresh updates. This would create an unnecessary uh, single point of failure. The values are read in on startup and they're cached by default. We need to force all the configuration clients to revisit the configuration, to redraw or refresh their configuration. And we can do this one of two ways. We can connect all of our microservices to an event bus. And that event bus can be used to, to federate changes so that all so connected microservices see the change as soon as a, a message is published into the bus. Fair enough. Another thing that we can do is to, to specifically on this one node, one instance, call an actuator endpoint called, guess what, refresh. And that, I think, is going to be our best route for now. So what I'm doing is I'm sending an empty HTTP post to forward slash refresh right on my microservice node. Now, what I'm going to do before I hit go, before I hit enter, I'm going to hit enter. And then as fast as my little fingers are going to let me, I'm going to hit command tab and then command R. There. I did it three times. Because I was focused on the wrong thing. Anyway, what that did was it uh, recreated that one bean in situ, so this one message rest controller, and it refreshed the configuration by drawing in the value from the config server. If I had injected this, I wouldn't have injected this into anything else as a rest controller, but any bean on which this annotation is sat can be injected into any other thing, naturally. If I had done that, the bean uh, reference itself would have still been valid. They wouldn't have, it wouldn't have suddenly been a null or something like that. Instead, this is a proxy, and the internal representation of the proxy would have been discarded and, and recreated in situ. So uh, this is not a great annotation to use for beans that have state. If you've got a thousand in-flight transactions, the last thing you want to do is have them you know, savagely destroyed right in the middle of, a, uh, of processing. This is great under the hand for stateless things like a REST controller or feature flag kind of uh, objects. Now, this is just a very sampling, a very small sampling of what we can do with the config server. The config service and, the, and this, this facility gives us the ability to support feature flags. I can now decouple the release of software from the deployment of that software. I can make uh, inert certain, certain parts of the functionality in the application in production and then activate them based on a flag that I can toggle at runtime. I have a server now in between my configuration source and my configuration client. So 
so that server can do things for me on my behalf. It can, uh, for example, be locked down. I can lock down the config service and the config client and expect that both sides should do X509 mutual authentication using certificates or HTTP basic authentication. Or uh, I can tell the config service that there are ciphered, con you know, encrypted values on property files that once the service and the client have connected and, and authenticated, should be symmetrically decrypted and given to the client, right? So I can do a lot of cool stuff by virtue of the fact that I've added this little bit of indirection. Uh, and also I've solved the centralization problem, the auditing and journaling problem, and the, the live refresh problem. So this is one very, very useful feature in a, in a distributed system once you have more than a few services hanging around. The next thing that we care about in a distributed system is how do these services talk to each other? How do we make it easy for them to, to find each other? In a dynamic cloud environment, things will come and go as they need, as capacity and demand dictate. So services tend to be fairly ephemeral. We need to make sure that uh, if a service goes down, that the other services that are looking for instances of that service are able to find alternatives, and that they're not trying to contact a dead node. At first blush, at first blush, this might seem to be a use case for DNS. But DNS is a poor fit for a dynamic cloud environment. DNS has several limitations. Naturally, it's pretty useful outside of a dynamic cloud environment, but in a cloud environment, it has several limitations. The first and most obvious of which is that it requires DNS. If you want to use DNS, you need a separate server, a DNS server. Fair enough, you're gonna have something like that somewhere, not, not you know, to be sure, but a DNS server is typically something that's managed by other teams, operations in particular. So that reduces your ability to affect change. Another problem with DNS is that it requires resolution. Again, fair mm -hmm. enough, but that resolution uh, can add latency. And if you don't have that resolution, the easiest way to get rid of that resolution is by doing caching, which creates its own problems. Because now you run the risk of having stale nodes in the cluster. Again, you're gonna have to solve that problem uh, with a lot of solutions, but it, it's, a, it's, a, it's something you should care about. There's a dynamic, there's a tension there. Another problem with DNS is that it's a pretty dumb protocol. It doesn't have the ability to answer questions about the state of the service itself. If I make a call as a client to a service that isn't available, it's no longer there, I'm gonna block. Hopefully, hopefully you've all read, internalized, applied, and kept under your pillow the copy of Michael Nygaard's amazing book, Release It. And, and if you've done that, then you've remembered to apply aggressive client-side timeouts and all of the connections in your code to anything, ever. Haven't you? Have you? Ha have you? You sure? You, you sure? Pop quiz, what's the default timeout for Java net URL connection. You don't know? Yeah, see, this is why you gotta be scared. I'm not saying you should be terrified, but yeah, you should be. The Java that net, that URL connection has a default timeout of like unlimited. So if you've got 100, 100 threads and you make 100, you've got a 101 requests and they're all calling a downstream service that isn't responding, you know, it's probably not gonna be great. It's much better instead to ask a question, is that service there? And if it isn't, then I'm gonna do something else, right? Instead of blocking. So that's a problem with DNS itself. Another problem with DNS isn't so much the problem with DNS as, as load balancers with DNS. Lo DNS load balancers and load balancers suffer from problems. DNS load balancers in particular, uh, well, they, they dole out DNS entries for a resolved address. Multiple different technologies, uh, including Java, <coughs> cache that resolved DNS by default. So if I use the JDK and I make a call to another uh, service and I use the DNS entry for that for that entry. The JDK by default caches that that resolved IP and it uses it for subsequent uh, calls. You've now defeated the DNS load balancing. Right? It's going to pin that request to that same node, which may go away. You can get around some of that with virtual load balancers, but whatever flavor of load balancing you're using, you still have another problem still, which is that the load balancer doesn't know about the nature of your work, of the nature of the requests, as far as the load balancer is concerned, all requests are created equal. It's got, it sees 10 requests, it sees 10 nodes, it round robin, round robin distributes them among the, the uh, 10 nodes in the, in the cluster. But we all know that not all requests are created equal. Some might take two minutes, some might take two milliseconds, right? You're, you're, you're the only one that knows the nature of these kinds of requests. So how do you build the programming logic? How do you, in your own code, address, you know, algorithmically <coughs> as, a, in a, as a heuristic, how do you address these kinds of concerns? For all of these reasons and more, while we want something like DNS, a, a logical mapping from a service ID to hosts and ports for that service, DNS isn't really a great choice. So to, to, to 
solve some of these problems, we're going to look at something called the service registry. A service registry is a phone book for the cloud. It's a logical mapping between a service ID and a collection of hosts and ports. And Spring Cloud supports uh, many, good many different uh, uh, service registration implementations or service registry implementations, not the least of which are Apache Zookeeper. How many of you have used Apache Zookeeper? Okay, all right, good stuff. What about uh, uh, HashiCorp console? Console. All right, that's awkward. A little bit. <laughs> A little bit. Uh, what about uh, etcd? Etcd. Okay. Uh, what about uh, Netflix Eureka? Netflix Eureka. All right. So uh, uh, Spring Cloud has discovery client abstraction implementations for all of these. Asterisk. The the implementation for etcd is not production. Not it's not GA yet. Right, not general availability, and I don't know when it will be, so don't use that. Okay, that said, these are all great choices, and in fact, there are others, right? So uh, um, Cloud Foundry can be used as a, as a service registry. There are others, but um, I'm a big fan of Netflix Eureka for two big reasons. The first, and perhaps most important, although it's a tight, it's a, it's a close one, it's a close call, the, the, the most important reason I'm a big fan is because it's been used at scale by one of the largest websites on the planet. So there's that. The second reason, and again, I'm not really, I'm, I'm, I'm ambivalent as to which is more important. The second is that it's really, really easy to set up and I'm very lazy. So, so there's that. So we're gonna go to start.spring.io and I'm gonna build a Eureka service registry and I'll say Eureka server and I'm gonna use the config client and I'll hit generate. Now, uh, I have to do the normal sort of pro forma stuff. I need to point it to the config server and start it up in my IDE and, uh, and so on, okay? So, whoop, come on. Application.properties, spring.cloud.config.uri equals HTTP localhost 8888 spring.application name equals eureka hyphen service. And uh, we'll rename this property file to be bootstrap.properties and we're gonna open up the Eureka service application. We'll say at enable discovery client and abracadabra, you're a Eureka server, okay? Goody. Now if I start that up, it'll spin up on port H761 if everything uh, goes to plan, which, you know, honestly, it may not. Okay. Voila. Now, a few things worth noticing. Very well done animated GIF. <laughs> <laughs> We have people for that. <coughs> and and no service is yet registered in the registry, nothing available for consumption. And we need to change that. The one big drawback, and by that, by big I mean very small drawback, uh, is that uh, service registration discovery is something that is invasive. It's minimally invasive with the in the case of Spring Cloud, but your code has to be aware of it. It's not something that's buried in the bowels of the operating system's networking stack, or in the case of the JDK in the JDK's networking facility, right? Uh, so we need to activate support for service registration discovery in our code here, in our reservation service. And we can do that because we have the Spring Cloud discovery client abstraction here. We've got Spring Cloud starter Eureka on the on a client class path, and then we can just add at enable discovery client there, and we'll restart. And it's gonna register itself with the registry. And then we can consume that service with a client, and that's what we're gonna do here. Now we get to the, the meat of the matter, right? We're gonna build a client that will talk to our downstream service by way of the registry. I'm gonna use, of course, the Eureka service registration discovery support. I'll use the config client. Uh, I'll use Zipkin for distributed tracing, RabbitMQ for stream processing, Hystrix for circuit breakers, Dual for microproxies, and REST repository support, and web support. And then we're gonna hit generate. That'll do, that'll do. Okay, and meanwhile, this has come to life and we can see it registered there. We can see that there's one instance on this IP, uh, this service ID and this port now available for discovery. Had I more than one, I'd see up, you know, N, where N could be one or a thousand or zero or whatever. Um, so, here's my client. <coughs> Here it is on this. And, you know, we might, <coughs> I don't know how long we've got for time, uh, but if there's, if there's an overtime round, I'll, uh, we'll do security. Security start microphone. How did I do that wrong? Deep 
dependency, Spring, Cloud, Starter, all off to, oh, geez, the memory. So the normal things first, right? So Spring dot application name, come on. I'm not, it's just hanging. So reservation hyphen client, Spring dot, uh, dot cloud dot config dot URI equals HTTP local host 8888. And uh, the normal sort of stuff, we gotta rename this property file to be uh, bootstrap.properties. And then we need to think about what we're trying to do here. Naturally, we wanna take advantage of service registration and discovery, but we're building an edge service. This is no meager, regular, standard uh, client. This is a, a service that is meant to sit at the edge of the architecture. It is meant to be the first port of call for services coming in from the outside. And <clears throat> there's a, a good reason for this. You see, in the 24-7 uh, internet of things, in the, in, the, in the world where we have basically almost everything has an IP, <coughs> in the world where basically almost everything has an IP address, we have lots of different clients out there. Uh, even the most conservative and boring of organizations today have at minimal a I iOS, an Android, and an HTML5 user experience. At minimal. A lot of times they have, to, they have more, right? And the Internet of Things makes this very simple. There are TVs, smart TVs, and PlayStations, and Rokus, and Xboxes, and cars now, and uh, uh, watches, and your, your tablets, and uh, uh, you know, the streets in Singapore have IP addresses just because of the uh, ER, ER, ERP, right? What's the, yeah, even those have sensors, right? The sensors are everywhere. So you wouldn't, you'd be astonished by the things that have IP addresses today. There are organs. There are people with, human beings with organs in them that have uh, IP addresses now. Seriously, like just an amazing, amazing array of things that are out there that have different security uh, and payload and protocol restrictions. So we need to accommodate these different clients, but if, we, if doing so meant that we had to change every single microservice, we'd be very, very quickly in a bad position where we have to re, uh, retrofit every single microservice for every new client, which is a non-starter. We'd lose some of the autonomy we're trying to gain in the first place. So instead, we need to adapt those requests, adapt those the connections to those uh, downstream services at the edge. The first example of this, the first kind of edge service that we're gonna look at here is called an, a micro proxy. A micro proxy blindly forwards requests back and forth from the outside to the downstream services and then back again. <coughs> Think about HTML5. How many of you have seen JS Linux? You see, HTML5 browsers today are insanely crazy, ridiculously, unnaturally powerful. Uh, as a demonstration, I submit to you this. This is uh, a project called JS Linux, which was created by a guy named Fabrice Bellaud in 2011, who, upon the introduction of typed integers and the ability to, and the ability to do bit twiddling in 2011 in JavaScript, uh, built an x86 machine code emulator. So right now, the latency you're seeing is not uh, anything I have any control over. It's the, the Wi-Fi here. Um, it's downloading a Linux kernel, which, you know, to be fair, can take a few minutes, take a few seconds. So we'll just wait awkwardly. There we go. It downloaded a Linux kernel, and then entirely in the client-side JavaScript, it boot, booted the Linux kernel. This is an HTML div element, though, right? The, the TTYS device is a Chrome HTML DOM. So if I now go here, lsla, vi hello.c, let me uh, escape this, escape i because I'm in vi, hello singa sug, 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 extra exclamation marks, escape, escape, colon, wq, <laughs> TCC minus O, hello, hello.c, that's the tiny C compiler because the GCC takes a little bit longer and we don't have time. Um, and now it's compiling the C code, because why not? Uh, <coughs> and then we're gonna run it. My point, is, my point here, my friends, is that your modern HTML5 browser is really, really powerful and you don't need to babysit it. You don't need to hold its hand. You don't need to, to, to serve it resource constrained or limited uh, Payloads. It can do an unnatural amount of things. Uh, that said, that said, it lives inside of a sandbox, and that sandbox precludes it from calling different services on different hosts. 
this is part of the, the security model for browsers, which makes sense. Good enough. You can get around this a couple of different ways. You can add a policy to each microservice that exempts cross-origin requests to that service, a policy that allows the, the clients that want to talk to it to call it. Or you could just proxy all requests back and forth because the first <coughs> option would require you to change every single microservice to accommodate every new client, which is, as we say, kind of a non-starter once you get more than a handful of services up and running. So let's look at our micro-proxy approach. We're going to use Zool. Now, I'm going to comment out a few dependencies for, for uh, efficiency here. Okay, now Zool is a project from Netflix. It's a, uh, it's, uh, we integrate it with Spring Cloud and, uh, and with uh, Spring Cloud's discovery client abstraction. Now Zool was named, of course, for uh, Ghostbusters. I don't know if you've ever seen that movie, but you'll know that Zool is the, the gatekeeper or the underworld to hell. <laughs> He's the proxy to hell. Now, I think he's from hell. <laughs> that was kind of the implication. It's been a while since I've seen the movie, if I'm honest. Uh, my friend, my friend uh, he, he said, you know, Josh, that's not really fair. We don't know that. It wasn't, he wasn't sure it was, it was stated in the movie either. He, he might come from a very nice place. He might come from Bali. We don't know. <laughs> like, it's not fair to judge. So I understand, and I, and I take it back. Anyway, he comes from somewhere. He's the proxy to that world, wherever that is. Um, so now the application's up and running on my edge service. And because of the integration and the awareness that Spring Cloud has, it's up and running on port 9999. And we can, while we could specify arbitrary routes, Zool, in conjunction with Spring Cloud and Spring Cloud Discovery Client, sets up automatic routes for us that talk to the, to the registry. So 9999 forward slash reservation hyphen service forward slash reservations. There we are. So there's my edge service on this port, on this service ID, and this context path. This is the same service as I've just called, uh, or just stood up a few minutes ago on <coughs> port 8000. So notice that when I go to 8000, I get the original service. When I go to the edge service on 9999, I get the proxy service. Same payloads. There's two questions you may have at this point. First of all, how does it know which instance to route the request to? How does it pick that, that instance? Right now, there's only one instance in the registry, so it stands to reason that it's going to use that one instance. But what if there were two, or five, or ten, or a thousand, or n greater than one? In this case, it has to make the decision on the client, and does this using something called Netflix Ribbon. Netflix Ribbon is a client-side load balancer. It codifies as objects the strategies that are used to, to make the routing decisions. The benefit here is that you have an object. You can plug in the strategy yourself. Now you can do more interesting things. By the way, does anybody know how to turn the air conditioning on in this thing? Air conditioning? Air con? The spice of life? <laughs> Thanks. Um, so it, there's a load balancer. There's a, a client-side load balancer that has different objects and different strategies for doing load balancing. By default, it's doing round robin, which is probably what you wanted. But because it's an object and because you can provide your own implementations, you can do all sorts of interesting things. You can do weighted response-based load balancing, or you could provide your own strategy that does something, for example, uh, data sharding. You might have, uh, you wanna, might want to uh, pin requests from a client to a specific node. Maybe you have an OAuth token, a stateless OAuth token, right? You want to you want to take this OAuth token and route it to a specific node. Maybe you're doing something stateful, like streaming video on a certain node. Maybe it's a Netflix use case, and you want to pin all subsequent requests to that particular node because streaming video is stateful. It, you can't load balance that. Whatever your, whatever your business use case is, you can program that. You can des design it, define it, and then reuse that strategy in Ribbon. And it gets plugged in for you automatically, in this case, by the Zool Microproxy. The other thing you may be wondering is how did these URLs get rewritten? And uh, in this case, there's a little bit of sleight of hand. The downstream service, my uh, REST repository, is smart enough to look for the incoming request and look in the headers, and it examines the request uh, headers and it uses a, uh, one of the headers which provides the origin URL to rewrite the links. And you can do the same thing in your own custom services. You can see the origin URL. So from the perspective of the client, from the perspective of the client, uh, it has no idea that this JSON uh, originated on anything besides localhost 9999. 
good enough. This might be enough. If you've got, uh, if you've got um, ubiquitous sort of HTTP and JSON, this might be enough. You might be done. You might be able to go home. You should probably, probably uh, use um, some sort of authentication mechanism, maybe HTTP basic or, or OAuth. You should absolutely, no questions asked, use HTTPS SSL, especially considering that it's a requirement for HTTP2, so you're gonna have to get there one way or another. That said, maybe that's enough, right? Maybe we've just done all that we need to do to, uh, to support our HTML5 clients. If that's the case, uh, then, then good, but sometimes clients require different views of the data, they require different parts of the API, they require different uh, views of the uh, data synthesized from different services, etc. And this requires a, this requires that we do some sort of translation or, or mediation or transformation, right? So what we're gonna do, can you, can you stop? Thanks. What we're gonna do is build a edge service that calls the downstream services and does some sort of translation or transformation. This is called an API gateway. An API gateway is like, an, is like a microproxy except that it does transformation or translation as opposed to blindly proxying things back and forth. We're gonna build a very, very simple API gateway, something that just calls a downstream service, so reservation API gateway, REST controller, private final REST template, and uh, we're gonna map this as a REST controller like this, at request mapping, map it. I'm gonna map it to forward slash reservations. I'm gonna say at request mapping, get equals value forward slash name. So now I'm gonna have an endpoint here that's going to return a collection of names. And uh, right now I'm not gonna return anything, but what we need to know is that I'm gonna use the REST template, Spring's REST template, uh, to make the REST call to the downstream service to get the JSON. Uh, and then we're gonna turn it back into a collection of hypermedia resource envelope objects with a payload type reservation, whose reservation name we're gonna you know, unpack and then put into a collection and send back. So we're gonna create a simple endpoint that just returns a collection of names. Very, very simple. Uh, I need this REST template to be aware of my client-side load balancing. The REST template is not by default aware of that. So we need to configure <coughs> a, uh, a REST template that knows how to do load balancing, and that's a fairly trivial affair. We just need to create the right beam, like this, and say at load balanced. At load balanced is a qualifier annotation that Spring will use to, uh, Spring Cloud will perceive, and it'll use it as a flag that uh, you want Spring Cloud to configure an interceptor on the REST template. An interceptor that is gonna be smart enough to, uh, to pre-process the request, extract from the host parameter or part of the URL, uh, the, 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 the string and then pass that to the registry, then get back a collection of service instances and then pass that to Ribbon to do client-side load balancing, right? So it'll make the decision based on all the different services that are in the registry, uh, all in the blink of an eye. So we'll see that here. We'll say this dot rest template dot exchange, HTTP colon forward slash res forward slash forward slash, uh, reservation hyphen service forward slash reservations get null so we're not gonna make an HTTP put or post, uh, so we're gonna say no, there's no body. Uh, and then finally for this final parameter, we need to tell Spring, we need to tell the REST template what kind of payload, uh, what kind of data we want to send back, right? Uh, we could say that we want the JSON from the downstream service. This is the service ID, by the way, not DNS. We could say that we want the JSON to be turned into a string, in which case the response from the REST template would be a string. We'd get the JSON delivered to us as a string. We could say that we want the, the data to be turned as a, as a map whose payload, uh, whose keys are rather are the attributes of the JSON and whose values are more maps. We could say that we want the value to be returned as a JSON node. This is a document object model-like structure. And we can programmatically interrogate the tree if we like. Uh, but what I really want, more than anything in the whole wide world, is to get back a collection of spring PodOS resource objects whose payload is of type reservation. But this won't work for two reasons. The first of which, of course, the most natural is that we don't have this type, right? 
This type doesn't exist on a class path. I could naturally copy the type from the service implementation. But for a couple of reasons, this is a poor fit, right? The first is I would be unnecessarily coupling my client-side representation to the implementation on the service side. That would leak uh, details, perhaps, the JPA implementation details to the client as well, both of which are undesirable. The other reason uh, that I don't want to um, copy the implementation from the, from the service side is because I can't necessarily be sure that I have an implementation to copy from the service side, right? I've heard, but I have never seen or, or confirmed a very interesting theory, my friend, a theory in the same way that we all regarded for the longest time the, the possibility of the Higgs boson particle. It's something that hasn't been substantiated by science, but it's again, it's theoretically possible, so I broach it here because I want you to be prepared for something that may, may happen. Uh, in theory, in theory, again, you know, skeptical, skepticism is warranted. But in theory, the service implementation could be, it could be implemented in something besides Spring and Java. And again, as far as I've seen, that's never happened. <coughs> so it's not really an issue. But it could be one of those other theoretical non-Spring Java technologies that I've heard about, but I've never seen. And if that happens, then we can't take for granted that we even have a Spring Java type to use on a client. Okay, so, so there's that. The other reason this doesn't work is because of, well, Java's lack of a generic type, type system. And to deep dive into that, we need to take a moment and take a look at some basic Java-isms. What, my friends, is the generic parameter for this instance variable at runtime? What is T? At runtime. That one, yeah. There's no. So, as a con, as a compromise of, as as a compromise made by the Java language designers in Java five more than ten years ago, uh, Java does type erasure. It burns away the those type parameters at runtime for instance variables. As far as Java is concerned, you wrote list x equals new list. There's no generic generic parameter, not even object, because object is a constraint. It has subtle nuanced differences between that and the, an untyped array list. We can get around this by creating a subclass. You can say class x extends array list of string, right? And uh, then say list of string x equals new x. And this will work. T in this case is a string. But it's not, it's not a, uh, not exactly what you want, right? You could also, you could also do an anonymous subclass at array list, curly bracket, curly bracket. There you go. Shrink the size. So there I'm creating a subclass. I'm overriding it, right? Override. So this actually works, but uh, again, kind of ugly. If you understand what we're doing here, that we're creating an anonymous subclass to capture generic information, to reify the generic parameter, then you know what we need to do. This hack, I'm sorry, uh, design pattern. It's called the type token hack pattern. pattern. Uh, and it's supported, well supported by different libraries, different technologies. It's by no means a, uh, something that we innovated in the Spring ecosystem. It's just something you have to do with Java. And it's well supported in Spring by the parameterized type reference. The parameterized type reference uh, you know, builds upon what I just showed you. It requires you to create a subclass. If I fail to subclass it, it doesn't compile. I don't have to override any methods. It's just that I have to subclass it. It's abstract. And in so doing, I can then ask the PTR, I can say, give me your Java lang reflect type. And Java lang reflect type, of course, is the uh, parent of Java lang class, which is all we need to answer this question. So I can give <coughs> the rest template that parameter there. And I can say, return response entity dot get uh, status code, no thanks, value, no thanks, headers, nope. I want the body, I want the content, I want to stream over it. I want to map from R to R of reservation name. I want to collect the results into a list and then return that back, okay? And there, my friends, we have a very simple API gateway. Three lines, three admittedly very, 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 very gnarly lines, but three lines. 
And if I restart this, we should be able to confirm as much. Now, uh, this will work just fine, but it ignores some of the realities of distributed systems. We've, we've very conveniently ignored the fact that uh, while this will work fine in the happy path, the happy path being that we have one or more instances of that service available, it ignores the fact that something's gonna go terribly wrong if we have no services over which to load balance. What's gonna happen if I try and load, by, load balance by zero? What, is it, what, is it, what happens if I divide by zero, so to speak? If I have zero instances of the service, it's not gonna be good, right? I'm gonna, I'm gonna, gonna get a big fat Java stack trace on my phone. My iPhone users aren't, aren't gonna like that at all. So we need, to, we need to be a little bit more honest with ourselves and understand that failure is a statistical inevitability. It will happen. It's not, a, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. In a sufficiently distributed system, it is futile to try and build a system on the predicated idea that uh, your systems will always be available. As you add more capacity, the high likelihood of something being down at some point goes up. If you have a few dozen nodes that can be minutes easily per, per day, if you have a few uh, hundred nodes that can be hours per day, it can be days per year if you have enough nodes, right? At, at some scales, it becomes something that's a statistical guarantee, and high-performing organizations understand this. They internalize it. There are people that wake up every day, every day, and they, they put on their Google underwear and their Google T-shirts and their Google socks, and they go, they go to the Google shuttle, the Google bus, and they go to the Google headquarters while talking to their Google colleagues and checking their Google mail and their Google phones. When they get to the Google headquarters, they may uh, talk to the Google, uh, may talk to other Google colleagues while having Google gourmet breakfast at the Google cafe cafeteria. <laughs> On occasion, as is want to happen, accidents will happen, uh, they may accidentally uh, spill some of the voluminous Google Kool-Aid on their Google t-shirts. That Google Kool-Aid does get everywhere after all. If they spill the Google Kool-Aid in their Google t-shirts, that may necessi necessitate a trip to the Google laundromat. If they go to the Google laundromat, well, that'll delay them even further. And in the meantime, they're going to have to stroll about in their Google gold sequined bathroom, waiting for their Google t-shirt to finish. And then, having done that, they may, since they're not quitters, get back on their horse and go back to the Google cafeteria and get on with breakfast. And after that, they may then decide, since it is getting on past 3 o'clock in the afternoon, to go to Google work. And this may mean getting on a Google bicycle or Google shuttle or Google bus or Google boat to the Google data centers, where they will walk the Google data center aisles and find completely and utterly unsurprisingly to them, given that they have more than two million enterprise-grade production servers deployed in Google data centers all around the world <coughs> that some of their Google servers have Google died. And they don't care. They don't care that some of their services died, some of their servers died. They didn't care at 8 in the morning when they got the alert that told them that. They don't care because they didn't build their services to be sensitive to the loss of a few nodes. This is why they're Google. And we need to do the same thing. We need to understand that failure will happen. Netflix understands this fact as well. They have a suite of software called the Simian Army. The Simian Army are basically little agents of chaos. They purposefully loose them on production during daylight hours, during office hours, when people are on hand, able to respond. These things do terrible little things in production. They kill minus nine processes. They RMRF database and disk partitions. They've even, even got one that, as I describe it to you now, gives me goosebumps. It's called Chaos Kong. And it purposely kills a whole data center availability zone. They do this to themselves during office hours to make sure that if there's a problem in the failover strategies, that there's somebody on hand to be able to respond to it. They'd much rather find out any kinks in the process during office hours when there are people there than at four in the morning when people are trying to sleep because they know that failure will happen. These organizations and many others besides, have an, uh, they have a mantra, a motto. They say, you build it, you run it. You're an adult. You can do whatever you want to solve the problem at hand, which, by the by, I think speaks volumes about why organizations like Netflix <coughs> use Spring Boot and Spring Cloud at scale. You're an adult. You can 
use the technology you want to solve the problem, but if something goes wrong, you're going to get the phone call at 4 in the morning. You build it, you run it. You see, we live in a different era right now. We live in a different time. Gone, gone, gone are the days when we had two different teams, operations and, dev and, and, uh, and developers. No longer are the developers exclusively charged with delivering business differentiating functionality and then throwing their product over the wall for the operations to, to deploy. And no longer is operations exclusively charged with ensuring the st stable functioning uh, uh, production environment. No longer is operations the, the sin eaters, right? For so long, we would take our terrible, terrible buggy code and throw it over the wall, and those poor, poor schlubs down the stream would have to make sure it worked in production. And if, if they ran it, then it's their, it's their fault now, right? But no longer are they the, the ones responsible for saying, no, we're not going to do it. They have to help the business move forward, too. Their job is not to say no to everything because it's, it's all going to fall apart. We live in a different world now. We have a word for this, right? We have the word DevOps. DevOps, as I'm sure you all know, I'm sure you all know this, that DevOps is an ancient, very ancient uh, uh, Malaysian word. It means empathy. Empathy for operations and developers. Empathy for each other on the team. It's a very ancient Malaysian word. In this world, it is no longer enough just to build code that works okay. It has to be corner case friendly. It has to understand that it has to embrace the fact that failure will happen and it has to do the right thing in the face of failure. That is a key tenet of a cloud native system. So looking at our example here, we've got an example that's doing load balancing across different nodes. What are we going to do if we have zero instances of that service? It's going to throw a big fat st stack trace. It's going to throw a big fat exception <coughs> and we're going to get a big fat Java stack trace and we need to do the right thing to counter that. I want to make sure that if something goes wrong that we have a fallback behavior. So I'm going to introduce what's called a circuit breaker. And we can do this because we have on our class path the Histrix, the Netflix Histrix circuit breaker. I'm going to say at enable circuit breaker and I'm going to create a fallback method. And the high performing websites will do this kind of thing all the time. They'll say, oh well, you went to the uh, search engine service. But the search engine isn't available. So we'll uh, We'll give you some machine learned recommendations from across the web. Here you are, right? It's better than nothing. It's certainly better than a big fat Java stack trace in the browser experience. Okay, so this is going to do. This will give us what we want for the read use case, right? It'll give us a fallback. It'll give us an empty collection for the read. But what about a write? What happens if we try and write this, write the data to the downstream service? How do we uh, post? that data? How do we confirm or guarantee that the data is being delivered to the downstream service? Now, before we do that, let's take a look at what's happening here. I'm going to kill the reservation service. Poor thing. And as I do that, you can see it's hesitating. You can see that it's hesitating, and I get the, I get the array list eventually. Command R, refresh. Command R, refresh, etc. So it's, it's timing out, and then I get the exception, then it gives me the fallback. If I deluge the downstream service, however, there, right? As I, if I deluge the downstream service, eventually it just stops trying and it gives me the fallback directly. This helps protect our downstream service. We all, we all know, of course, that if a website isn't responding, the best thing you can do is to refresh the browser a lot, right? <laughs> is, that, is that true? No? Well, it doesn't work in distributed <laughs> systems either. So this defeats that effect. This defeats the, 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 the unnecessary traffic that's helping, that's preventing our service from coming back online. If you've got something like Cloud Foundry, a platform that is built to operationalize applications, then Cloud Foundry will move heaven and earth all day and all night to make sure that if you say, I want 10 instances of the service running at all times, that darn it, there are 10 instances of the service running at all times. But we need to build our software to be uh, to be resilient in the face of topology changes. So now let's go back to that question of what about rights? How do we guarantee that if we have a downstream service and we want to send data to that downstream service, how do we guarantee that that data gets there eventually? You can't really circuit break, it, circuit break that, right? If I, if I post to my edge service, 
my downstream service isn't available, what do I, what do, I do? This is a fundamentally uh, classic, you know, ancient kind of question. This is something that's not, it's not a new idea, it's not a new problem. Uh, what we need to do is to get two nodes separated by a network partition to agree upon state. Classic problem. There are many different ways to solve this problem. Many, 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 many different ways to solve it. One solution that doesn't really solve it is to use distributed transactions. If you ever feel the urge to use distributed transactions, if that ever strikes you as an idea, I urge you to stop. Go home. Drink some absinthe. Pet the cat or the dog. Hug your family. And reconsider your terrible life choices. And then come back perhaps the next day or next month after you've reconsidered and try again. For you see, distributed transactions as modeled by JTA, which is the, the client-side middleware for the XOpen protocol, are a terrible idea. They just in introduce another single point of failure and they gum up the works unnecessarily in, a, in an otherwise fast-moving system. Avoid them at all costs. There are superior alternatives, newer, but still superior alternatives. There is, for example, the saga pattern. The saga pattern was introduced in the 80s. That's right, 30 years ago. It's still a better idea. The saga pattern says that if you can design or model your system as a set of interleavable, that is to say, reorderable transactions, and then guarantee, or rather assign for each one of these interleavable transactions, a compensatory transaction, that is to say, a transaction that semantically sets the system back to a well-known state. And, as, and if you can make, make it so that those compensatory trans transactions are idempotent, that is to say you can reapply them multiple times, then you can build a system that will guarantee consistency eventually. Think about the kayak.com use case, right? Kayak.com or orbits.com or whatever. It's a website where you can go and book a hotel, a car, and a flight all at the same time. Uh, if you have this use case, well, first of all, the XOpen protocol doesn't apply. These, these services are all based on REST. They don't have, the, they don't implement XOpen, right? So that's not, it's a non-option anyway. So if you have these different transactions, I call the, the hotel website, I, hot I call the, the uh, car or the flight website, I call the, uh, um, uh, which one, hotel, car, flight, I, ca I call all three. If one of them fails, I cancel the bookings for the car, the hotel, and the flight. That's an example of using the saga pattern to get consistency in a distributed system. And that works, right? There's lots of different implementations for that. In our case, we don't even need to go that far. We can use something much simpler. We can use eventual consistency. Eventual consistency is a $5 word for messaging. We're going to do a right behind. We're going to publish a message from the producer to the downstream consumer. This is messaging. It's classic, right? 40 years plus. We can use spring integration. Spring integration has at its heart the concept of a message channel, a spring framework message channel. A message channel is a Java util queue, basically. It's a named conduit through which messages pass. And you can compose message channels. You can compose interesting solutions by stitching together components in between these different channels. I might have an, a, a component that takes messages in, messages in from the outside, turns it into a spring framework message, passes it through a message channel, sends it out the other side of a message channel, does some sort of enrichment or filtering or splitting or you know aggregation, sends it into another message channel, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Spring integration, by its very nature, is meant to handle integration use cases. So it'll work with all manner of different systems, whether they're necessarily event-based or not. All things are event-based, but the API may not be so friendly to being event-based, right? So it'll, it'll let you talk to uh, an FTP server, or email, or IMAP, or you know, Twitter, or a file system, or you know, anything, or a message <coughs> broker. You have to wire up this configuration, though. You have to wire up the, uh, the inbound adapters and the outbound adapters, which is fine. But this is a little too low level for our purposes. We're not going to use FTP, are we? We're not going to use FTP as the, the broker between microservices. I'm not going to email my write from my edge service to my downstream reservation service either. So spring integration, however useful, it's a little low level. We can move up the stack and the abstraction a little bit if we're willing to take for granted uh, the fact that we're going to use a highly concurrent, highly efficient uh, uh, message broker. Something like RabbitMQ or Apache Kafka or, or Redis even. If we're willing to do that, then we can get a lot of benefits. We can use something called Spring Cloud Stream. Spring Cloud Stream 
makes declarative and a matter of convention and configuration the wiring of these different channels. We define the channels and then work with them declaratively. We don't have to worry about how these things get uh, stitched together. So let's take a look at that right now. Now, I've got here the reservation service. Where's my reservation client? In my reservation client, I'm going <coughs> to define, I'm going to go back to my build here. I'm going to bring in these last two dependencies for now. Okay. I can say interface reservation client channels. And I can say that I want to define a channel that's going to be going out. I'm going to send a I'm going to send messages on the output channel. So it'll be called output message channel output. And this is a, you know, one channel. I could have as many channel definitions in this interface as I'd like. But in this case, it suffices to leave it as is. And I tell Spring Cloud Stream that I want this definition to be hydrated. I want this, these uh, channel definitions to be created for me uh, by the framework, by the abstraction. And I know that I'm going to use RabbitMQ because I've elected to do so here in my stream binding uh, definition, my implementation, the Rabbit def implementation. I'll show you in a minute how this configuration actually corresponds to the broker itself. But for now, it suffices to say that Spring Boot has automatically configured a RabbitMQ connection factory. We could, of course, customize that by providing properties and application.properties. Uh, and then we'll look at, this, look at that in a minute. Now, in my code here, I can now create uh, a new endpoint, public void write request body reservation, reservation. I can say at request mapping method equals post. And I can say private final message channel out. And in my constructor here, I'm going to inject that channel, that reservation client channels. This dot out client channels dot output. Okay. And in my code here, I can say, let's create a message of type string, message equals message builder. Dot with payload reservation dot get reservation name dot build, and then let's send the message on the output channel like that. So that's just basic. Spring Integration messaging code. I'm publishing a message on the channel. I'm not worrying too much about how that channel is being connected to the down downstream service. On the other side, on the service, the consumer, the reservation service is the consumer of the data. I need to bring back in my Spring Cloud Stream RabbitMQ binding, uh, which I do have, and I define the input channel instead. So I'll say interface reservation <coughs> service channels, and I'll say at input subscribable channel, whoops, input. And I'll say at enable binding reservation service channels dot class. And here I'm going to say message endpoint class reservation processor public void on new reservation message string message. Okay. Service activator input channel equals input. And all I'm trying to do is whenever there's a, an incoming message, I'm going to write the data to the database using my repository. So I'll say this dot reservation repository at save new reservation message dot get payload, etc. So that's pretty straightforward, I think. Now let's go ahead and start up the reservation service and we'll take a look at the configuration that's making this all work. So we can visit the reservation service configuration, rather the reservation client configuration here. And we can see that it says spring cloud stream bindings output dot destination equals reservations. Output is the name of the channel definition in the broker. Reservations is the name of the exchange or the, um, sorry, output is the name of the uh, channel in the Java code. Reservations is the uh, memory in the broker upon which the, both the producer and the consumer need to agree. This has to be the same for both the client and the service. You'll see that we've got that line, of course, the Spring Cloud bindings input that destination equals reservations. These other lines are, what's, are what, are, what are more interesting. You see, by default, Spring Cloud stream bindings are publish, subscribe, one to many, broadcast. So as I publish a message, as I produce a message to a, a Spring Cloud stream, the consumer will, by default, broadcast that message across all the different, uh, sorry, all consumers will get the same message. Uh, if you have 10 consumers, 
listening for messages on the exchange, then you'll get uh, 10, different mess 10 different copies of the same message, which we don't want. So this is what this is. This is a group that says, for all the consumers in the same group, in this case the reservations group, deliver the message only once to any one node. So you'll get at most one semantics instead of uh, load balancing, or instead of duplicated you know, broadcast messaging. Point to, you'll get point to point semantics. Here we're saying that uh, the subscription is durable. This says if the downstream service isn't available, then the broker will re-deliver it as soon as one of the instances becomes available. So this, this is guarantees that even if the service isn't available, the message eventually gets delivered, which is what we want in this case. Okay, so that's the uh, service. What about the client? Is it possible to get the air conditioning turned on or did we talk about that? Is that a no? Is it, is it just me or is it warm in here? I'm it's hot. It is hot, right? Yeah. Can we I mean open the doors, <laughs> put some air? Open, open the window. I mean just anything. Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, I mean, just break them, right? Yeah, yeah, please. Like it's staggeringly, like, stiflingly hot in here. Oh, I think it's actually doesn't matter. Um, I mean, I, yeah, thanks. Maybe it's just that maybe the air conditioning is just for those people out there and <laughs> not for us. Is it going on out there? Is the air conditioning going on out there? Oh, <laughs> it's just not in here. Yeah, open the, yeah, if we open the doors, that'll be. There's a hot spot. Sorry? There's a hot spot. Yes, you can get a hot spot. The hot spot? Right, uh -huh. so well, to be sitting at a hot spot, so too bad. Are you air conditioned? I'm not sitting hot. <laughs> oh. But I, I didn't talk half as much as you did. Yeah, that's true, but yeah, I'm not I'm not running WebSphere. Like my computer's not hot. I, I shouldn't <laughs> you know, I should be I should be cool too, you know. Anyway. Goody. So now I've got, I've got the. Uh, let's see. We've got local host, ninety nine, ninety nine. Reservation names. There's my reader, right? That's the reader. Uh, let's look at the uh, writer. So I'm going to send some of my favorite doctors to the downstream service via the edge service. I'm going to post some data to the edge service that we just stood up, the API gateway endpoint. So we'll say quote quote. Okay, reservation name. And I'm going to send a few of my favorite doctors. So Doctor Who. And then I'll say minus H, content hyphen type, application, JSON. And I'll send it to the local host 9999. Reservation names. Okay. Uh, what did I do? Oh, reservations. Thank you. So there's that, right? Doctor Who. And uh, we'll send a few of my few more of my favorite doctors. So Dr. Seuss, Dr. Strange. Okay. <laughs> there they all are. So that's working in the happy path. But now what happens if we kill our poor, poor reservation service yet again? Okay. Goodbye. Now those three doctors are gone. They're no longer there because we've killed the, the process and remember it had in an in-memory embedded SQL database, so that data's gone. I'm gonna now send f three more of my favorite doctors. Dr. Pollock, he's the uh, uh, founder of Spring.net, a Spring Framework contributor, co-founder of Spring AMQP and Spring XD and Spring Cloud Dataflow. I'll send Dr. Sire. Dr. Sire is a uh, founder of Spring Batch. He's a Spring Framework committer. He's a uh, co-founder of Spring Boot and Spring Cloud and uh, uh, also Spring AMQP. And uh, then we're going to send Dr. Subramaniam. Now, Dr. Subramaniam uh, is just the coolest cat. I mean, they're all really cool, but if you get a chance to see some non-spring technologist, Dr. Subramaniam's legit. Okay. 
Uh, there we go. So now I've delivered those three doctors, but they're not going to be delivered to the downstream service as the downstream service doesn't exist. So what's going to happen? We're going to see that re we're going to see that reflected, hopefully, in the redelivery of those messages when the service starts up. Now, consider that we have these uh, twelve records here. So the command line render is going to get run when the application starts up, and we're going <coughs> to see those twelve records registered in the in the database. Uh, we're going to also see that those doctors were delivered before the command line runner gets run. So we should see here. Doctors Pollock, Sire, and then a, you know interleaving because of concurrency, and then Doctor Subramanian. So there we go. So that works. We've, na we've now mm. built a system that is resilient in the case of failure for both reads and writes. We've guaranteed. We've done something, right? We've done something to make our make our system more robust. Uh, I'm a big believer in style, though. So let's take a brief moment to clean up this code a little bit to to make it a little bit more uh, elegant. What I want is to simplify the code, the surface area of the, the code that's being used to talk through these downstream services. Right now, right now I've only got, you know, I've only got two endpoints. I've got a, a post that I'm doing that's sending a message via RabbitMQ, and I've got a read that's using uh, the REST template. It wasn't, it's only one endpoint on each for both REST and for, for messaging, right? It's not so bad, but what happens if I had more than a few endpoints, more than a few interactions, as, it, as is going to reasonably happen in a distributed system? I'd have to rewrite this logic for every single client of that service, which could become very tedious very quickly. And one option, of course, is for the teams that build the service to also build a client, but that risks, uh, that risks uh, having too much magic or too much business logic in the client code. The team that builds the API may treat the client as a crutch. The service should have all that it needs to do its work. If the client is enforcing business logic in the Java code, then it's going to be very hard to port that to, for example, another language to use that same uh, API. So you want to you want to make sure that the client is as minimal as possible. So for this reason, Amazon has famously said, "No uh, team shall build clients for their own APIs; others will do it." Some organizations, like Netflix, are kind of they want they have the same reservations, but they understand that sometimes it's useful for the team that ships the API to also build a few useful client bindings. But they don't want too much magic in the client code as well. As well, so. They make it easy as possible to build those client uh, um, interfaces automatically. One way they do that for REST is to use something called Fane. Fane is a um, a way of building declarative REST clients. Now, Fane in English uh, means to pretend, right? To play dead, for example. If you're if you're uh, if you're an, if you see an animal in the forest like that, right? Then that animal is feigning dead. He's pretending to be dead. Like, like WebSphere feigns utility, right? It's not utility, but it, it tries to. <laughs> so, so we're going to create a declarative REST client here. We're going to say interface reservation reader, okay? And we're going to say that we want to call an endpoint by calling the read method, and that endpoint is going to, the, the call that we're going to make is an HTTP GET call. And it's going to call the reservations endpoint, and it's going to call the reservation hyphen service, and this will benefit from the same kind of load balancing and all that that we've seen before. It benefits from Spring Cloud's awareness of the registry and of, of ribbon, so that's automatically done for us. And we just need to activate Fane here by saying at enable Fane client. Now, of course, I've done the wrong thing. I built my Fane client on the service, which makes no sense. So let's copy that here and. And voila. Okay, so put that over there. <coughs> and we'll go to our build, and we'll make sure that we have Spring Cloud Fane here. Okay. This is the service. Let me get rid of that Fane dependency there because we don't need it. Now, there's the client. This is the Fane client. That'll work for the. Uh, the read use case, and we can now throw away the REST template. Hi, boss. Oh, thank you. Is that so what is Gold that? Exposed, did you? <gasps> you like Green it? tea, too. You have no idea. All <laughs> all poor Sergio, his, this poor, poor guy, all day I've just been like, I because I quit coffee, oh. I don't drink soda, I don't even, and I, I just have minimal green tea, <laughs> minimal black, you know, minimal caffeine, you know, Okay. whereas black tea has a lot. So this has been like the one thing I've been looking for all over Asia, and, and you made my... <laughs> you want one more? No. Ten more? <laughs> Maybe later, yeah. Twelve more? Yes. Okay, sure. Oh. 
It's like you read my mind. Santa Maria. Okay. So, now, I've got a REST template here. I no longer need that, right? I've got my, my Thane client. So I'm going to say reservation reader. Nope, wrong reader. Uh, and uh, let me see. I can get rid of all of that, and I can say return dot read. Okay, I need to inject that reservation reader into the constructor. So there's this. We'll say reservation reader, and there we go. Sorry, uh, we'll say reservation reader down here. This dot reader equals reservation reader. But what about the write, right? The writing, the writing is being done using messaging. So I'm publishing the message to my downstream service. In here too, it's only three lines, but again, that, that would very quickly add up if I started to have more than a few uh, interaction models, right? So I can get the same effect. I, don't, I, I can't use Fane dire directly, but I can use spring integration messaging gateways. A messaging gateway in enterprise application integration parlance is a, is a facade for messaging logic. It's so that the client can use the downstream messaging system without being too in, in intrinsically aware of it, right? So we can so get the same thing. Can you use this code to like start spring reading? Okay. For sure? No. <laughs> but <laughs> if we have to. Yeah, I think we have to. Okay. Yeah, 10 minutes it is. 11. <laughs> anyway, we can build a, a writer. So we can say a reservation writer. Void write string rn, and uh, it's a gateway. So the gateway is going to send messages on the output channel. The payload will be sent on the on the uh, output channel, and uh, it's it's going to be w it's going to be workable because we're going to have integration component scan on the class path, and then that means we can throw away this code as well, right? So all that stuff goes away. I don't need it. I can say this dot. Uh, private final <laughs> reservation writer writer this dot reservation writer dot write and uh, sorry this dot reservation writer equals and we'll just pass in the writer so okay so there we are now that code becomes markedly simpler as well we can say this dot reservation writer dot write, reservation dot get reservation name, and there we go. So that's that's the same code, it's just, you know, I think it's a little easier on the eye, and, and it's the cognitive overhead of understanding what's happening is far diminished, right? We don't have to, to think too much about uh, what logic is happening here. We can just look at the declarative interface. And at this point, there's no really, there's no real risk in the, in the teams that built this API uh, if they shift a client that's based on those, right? Because the, the hard part is, not being done by something you have to parse or understand anyway. So we can restart. Now, whilst that's restarting, let's take a look at the last, that last tenant of a cloud native system. And I talked about it a little bit earlier, but uh, we, sh we need to revisit this idea of observability. You see, thus far we've built a system that lends itself to agile and easy uh, evolution. We've built a system that benefits from the elasticity and the dynamicism of cloud environment. And we've built a system that uh, is uh, resilient and robust in the face of of uh, service outages and topology changes. And we have, to a point, by using the actuator, built a system that is observable. That is to say, I can monitor it by th from its outputs. But <coughs> we haven't captured emergent behavior of the system. You see, the map is not the terrain. If you're walking around here in, in, in beautiful Singapore, is that the same thing? Is that the same thing as looking at a Google map of Singapore? I submit that there's a lot more interesting stuff happening on the ground, walking amongst the people, walking amongst all the wonderful hawker stalls and smelling all the great food and, and, and listening to the hustle and bustle of the uh, sort of people in the city, right? Or in the malls. That is far more vivid, more uh, interesting than the Google map of Singapore. The map is not the terrain, it's not the same thing. The same is true for your system. The architecture diagram for your system is very different from the emergent behavior that you can only hope to capture by observing the system in production 
And we need to do that. We need to understand what the system is doing, not just individual nodes, but the interplay between services in the system. One natural place to do that is through the circuit breakers. Remember that the circuit breakers uh, represent the connective tissue, if you will, between one service and another. And that's great for services over which you have the ability to influence or inform uh, you know, uh, ob observability monitoring and, and, uh, and uh, security and so on. But it's even better for, s for services over which you don't have that control. You see, if I have a circuit breaker, that circuit breaker may be something that's connecting to another service that may not be available. If I don't have the ability to change how that service is, is behaving or change its uh, resilience qualities or to add monitoring to it, then I can at least add monitoring to the circuit breaker. I can protect my system. That's what we're trying to do here. So <coughs> we're going to build a dashboard that will show us the flow of data through that circuit breaker. Localhost 8888 spring.application name equals Histrix dashboard. And we'll rename this bootstrap.properties. We'll open up, we'll uh, configure this rather to use the dashboard. And what this dashboard is going to expect is a service and event heartbeat stream, a heartbeat stream that the circuit breaker on the uh, edge service will emit for us automatically. That heartbeat stream is never ending. Oh, for that matter. There. So that heartbeat stream is never ending. It's infinite. It goes on and on and on forever. It has no end. It is without cease. It has no bounds, no limit. It continues forever, like the skies, like the seas and the stars and the ocean, like the bugs in your code, just infinite, <laughs> just infinite, <laughs> just unlimited. And so whatever you do, whatever you do, do not, and I, and I cannot stress this enough, do not curl this endpoint. <laughs> now, what we're going to do is we're going to put this in our Histrix dot, or in our, in our Histrix dashboard here, and we're going to paste this here like so. So there we are. We're going to hit monitor, and having done that, we can go to the edge service and drive some traffic to see what's happening. Now, as I drive traffic on the left, you can see a moving average spiking ever upwards on the right, 21, 28, 52, etc., and things are happy, this is a happy path, 0% of the errors, 0% of the requests that are going through are having any errors, there's no trouble right now, so it's working, uh, and as I let go of the gas, I can see the, uh, the moving average going downward. If I were to kill the downstream service, then my, eventually my, my circuit breaker would open up and I'd see the fallback mechanism kick in, and this would say <coughs> open. So this is one way to get visibility as to what's happening in the system. Now, my favorite approach <coughs> to doing this is to use distributed tracing. Distributed tracing, in theory, is very simple. What you want to do is, for every request that enters or exits a node in the system, you want to ensure that there's a unique ID by which you can correlate uh, the flow of a message through a system. A unique ID that you affix to every message on entry or exit, right? At, at every ingress or egress point in the architecture. And this sounds, it sounds simple. But in point of fact, it actually is quite difficult. You see, uh, think about all the places where messages enter or exit the system right now. In Spring MVC, in the Zool microproxy, via the REST template, via the Fane client, via RabbitMQ for input and output, for example. Even, even in this very simple system, there's a lot of places where we'd have to write the right logic to intercept all that behavior. And we'd have to do so in every node in which we want this behavior, this effect. So this isn't, uh, this isn't a good idea, right? It's not, it's not something you are in the business of trying to solve anyway. This is a concern that has to be dealt with and it's useful for understanding what's happening, but it's not something you should be writing. We have an abstraction called Spring Cloud Sleuth, like a, like a detective, a sleuth. Spring Cloud Sleuth is a, dis a disco sorry, distributed tracing abstraction and it's already in play on the class path of my applications by virtue of the fact that I've got here Spring Cloud Starter Zipkin. And we'll get to what Zipkin is in a second, but you can, already see, you can already see here on the console the results of this. We have the service ID, the trace ID, and the span ID. The trace ID is the <coughs> aggregate journey. It's the unique ID that represents the aggregate journey 
from A to Z, from the very beginning of our system to the very end of our system, from, from the very beginning of the request of a, the journey of a request to the very end of the journey of a request. The span idea, on the other hand, is a unique ID that represents each hop in the journey from A to B, from B to C, from C to D, from D to E, etc., etc., etc. This is interesting, and uh, we, if you've got something like Cloud Foundry, it's dead simple to drain your logs for all your different services into a syslogd compatible endpoint, like, for example, Elasticsearch or Splunk or Paper Trail or whatever. And there you can do log archaeology. You can find, you can follow the flow of a message by, you know, s uh, sifting through the logs and finding where these these log IDs are. Now, I'm a big believer that a picture is worth a thousand spans, so. Uh, instead, we're going to use a Zipkin. We're going to use the Zipkin distributed tracing technology. So I'm going to say Zipkin server, Zipkin UI, config client Eureka, and hit generate. Okay. Oh yeah. So there we are. That enables Zipkin server application. You okay? There we are. So now, that's going to spin up on port 9411. 9411. Or not. Oh. Come on, faster. People are waiting. Okay, so right now it's not aware of our services yet, but we can make it aware by, you know, <coughs> driving some traffic through it. There we are. Now, if I click on this, you can see it, it knows about my client and it knows about my service. Let's make some uh, posts here, right? Dr. Subramanian, Sire, Pollock. So now, if I refresh that, client. We can see that it knows about the different endpoints that have been uh, hit in the different services. I can click on the reservations endpoint here, hit find trace, and I can see that, uh, you know, for example, less than a minute ago there was a request that had five spans, and you can follow the flow of the message through the system. It, you can see that the aggregate journey, the total journey, took 26.2 uh, milliseconds, and that the message started at the reservation client, going, and I like to read it like this. I say, read it from. The, the service ID on the left going to the endpoint on the right. So it's at the reservation client going to the reservation names endpoint on the reservation client or at the reservation client going to the names method at the reservation client going to the reservations endpoint <coughs> at the reservation <coughs> service going to the you know spring data rest git collection resource endpoint. And if I click on individual parts here I can see the log of the message through the system. I can see the ingress and egress log. I can see metadata about the request itself. For example, the, uh, the tags that are used to uniquely identify the service. This is why I like microphones. So I can see the individual tags. Now, these tags identify the request, the nature of the request, and you can contribute custom tags as well so that you can easily correlate business transactions to request if you like. Uh, th this also works for the messaging stuff, right? So here it says output. I'm gonna go to the message channel called output. I click on this and it says <coughs> that I made a request that took 37 milliseconds. Good Lord, my, my goodness, that's very slow. Let's try another one that's more representative of, oh, this one, two minutes ago. Seven milliseconds, yeah. So this is the RabbitMQ, a Rabbit, RabbitMQ post going from the reservation client to the reservation's endpoint, which then went to the write method, which then went on the output channel, and then eventually it arrived on the input channel. But there's a bit of a gap here. Can anybody tell me what that gap is? Usually these are overlapping timings. That makes sense, right? It's uh, what happened. Why is there a gap? Don't all raise your hand at once now. Why is there a gap between the output channel on the reservation client and the input channel on the reservation service, the spring integration 
messaging channels. Network. What? Network. Yeah, kind of. I mean, RabbitMQ, where, where network in this case means RabbitMQ. So the message was delivered on the output channel, and then it transited between the c producer and the consumer, it transited through RabbitMQ, and then it d got delivered to the other side. So we don't have any instrumentation in RabbitMQ itself, but you can kind of figure out what's happening there. Uh, this is going to happen for anything generally async, right? Uh, normally, in a synchronous transaction, <coughs> the start of the transaction necessarily takes longer than the sub-transaction underneath it, right? If I have a transaction that starts from here and takes 20 seconds, and then five seconds into it, I call another service and I synchronously wait for the response, naturally, the outer transaction is going to be at least as long as the inner transaction. With async, that's not necessarily true. Or if it is true, you don't know it, so we, we see these gaps, right? And that's what's happening here in the rabbit queue. Now, this information is useful. And you get this pretty graph, which I like. The graph shows you the, top, the ontology, the topology. I can see that the res reservation client is used by the reservation or uses the reservation service. I've made 17 calls, etc. cetera. Um, but this is not for customer service. You're not gonna use this to find out what Jane did on the website five years ago. Most organizations don't keep more than a week's worth of this information on hand. And even that should be a subset of the information that's on this in the system. By default, Spring Cloud Sleuth captures 10% of the requests in the system. Twitter, who originated Zipkin, Zipkin is their open source distributed tracing platform. Twitter captures something like one out of every, every few million requests. Right? So your, the goal here is to find patterns emergent in the behavior of the system. How much money did we make in the last quarter? No idea, but I can tell you what the average latency on the website has been for the last hour. This gives you that visibility, that systemic emergent behavior. My friends, I think that's a kind of a good place to cut it. You see, we've, we've looked at the four tenets of a cloud native system. We've looked at how to build a system that is agile and lends itself to easy evolution. We've looked at how to build a system that benefits from the elasticity of a dynamic cloud environment. We've looked at how to build a system that does the right thing in the face of failures. And we've looked at how to build a system that is observable. Uh, I wish we had more time so that we could actually cover something. You know, I really feel like we've just skimmed the photo, which, it tr which itself is just of water. We didn't even skim the water. We just skimmed the photo of the water. But, but maybe next time. Had we more time, we might be able to look at, uh, for example, distributed uh, secure sign-on, single sign-on, right? Federated sign-on using Spring Cloud Security for OAuth. Right? How do I handle protecting my different microservices and rejecting requests? that are un otherwise unauthenticated. We might be able to look at Spring Cloud Cluster, whose functionality has now been moved into Spring Innovation to handle concerns like leadership election and you know leader node, worker node uh, promotion and demotion. Uh, if we had more time, we might look at how we can take messaging-based microservices as we've built them here using Spring Cloud Stream and compose them together to form more interesting solutions. Remember that Spring Cloud Stream input and Spring Cloud Stream output are basically commoditized transports. What else do you know that has a commoditized transport that, that composes very nicely? Standard in, standard out come to mind. And if you've ever, if you ever, ever used Bash, then you know that you can re build really interesting solutions by composing little atoms of functionality. The same holds true for messaging-based microservices. And we have a technology called Spring Cloud Dataflow, which allows you to orchestrate these kinds of messaging-based microservices into more complex stream-based, stream processing solutions. But we don't have time. Fair enough. Um, I'm happy to take any questions, but I, what I, and I, and I, I do want to know before you ask me questions, did you, did you like any of this? Did any of this s seem relevant or useful to you? Okay, good. Because I'm a big fan of this stuff and I, I would love it if you liked it as well, you know? Uh, I'm obviously a big fan. I'm wearing a, a spring t-shirt and a spring underwear, of course. <laughs> <laughs> of course, of course I like it, of course. Uh, but, but you don't have to take my word for it. There are small uh, companies, small mom and pop shops that are, uh, that are using this stuff to, to great effect. There's a, a small company in, in, uh, in Los Altos in the States called Netflix uh, who, who are using Spring Boot and Spring Cloud at scale to build services, and they've talked about this uh, several times in public. Uh, there's a, a, small, uh, a small business in, in next door China uh, called Alibaba. Alibaba 
is using Spring Boot and Spring Cloud at scale, and they've talked about it loudly and publicly as well uh, in their systems, right? Um, several different businesses, actually, several different businesses under Alibaba um, are using Spring Boot and Spring Cloud. Um, there's a Baidu, also in neighboring China. Baidu is a small search engine. They're the number three search engine after Google and, uh, and Bing. And Bing, of course, powers Yahoo, so Yahoo doesn't count. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, it doesn't, just saying. So, um, so they're using Spring Boot and Spring Cloud in several places as well at huge scale, right? Uh, we, we talk about web scale, screw that, China scale, right? So these, these organizations are using this stuff very successfully. If, if, if Amazon.com is the Alibaba of the West, then I suppose Rakuten.com would be the Alibaba of the further east in Japan. And they're also using Spring Boot and Spring Cloud at scale, and they've talked about it, right? Um, <coughs> Baidu and uh, Rakuten are also using Cloud Foundry, right? So is Yahoo Japan. So these are organizations that have the money, <coughs> the, re the, the brain trust, the resources, and the motivation to solve these problems. <coughs> but they're still building upon Spring Boot and Spring Cloud for new stuff, and wherever possible, they're taking old stuff that they, if they can and moving to that. You see, these organizations have to solve these problems. They need to deliver better software faster to production. That is, after all, the name of the game. The goal here is to differentiate through better delivery of software. And there's a lot of things that you need to do to get that done safely and effectively. And I hope we've underscored that there are solutions to address some, some of those problems, some of those <coughs> things that you need to do. If you have more questions, I'm happy to answer them. I'm online, as I mentioned before. There's also great guides at spring.io forward slash guides. I don't need to dwell too much on that fact here at the Spring uh, user group. And um, I just wanted to say thank you very much for having me today. It was a lot of fun. Oh. Well, all right, that was fun. Any questions, thoughts, feedback? Sure.